Hi there. In this video, we're going to cover a sort of even more general form of test for heteroscedasticity, which is known in econometrics as the white test for heteroscedasticity. Okay, so remember what we were doing in the Broich Pagan test? The idea was that we had some sort of population process, and within that population process, there was some sort of population error, and that population error, the variance of that tended to depend on some sort of linear combination of all my independent variables. So the idea with the um, broich pagan test is that even though we don't observe the population error, we can calculate our sort of estimated population error, which we get from running our first, this regression up here at the top. And that just comes about um, just from our sort of fitted values, which we get from least squared. So we get our sort of estimated error, which we call residuals. And the idea there is that we, if we square that, and then if we regress that on, let's say, delta naught plus delta 1 times x1, and we sort of regress it on all of our independent variables all the way up to xp, uh, and then if any of these particular deltas on our x terms here are statistically different from zero, the idea is that we then have some sort of form of heteroscedasticity. And it could be heteroscedasticity about any sort of linear um, variable which we have in our independent variable set. Okay, so even though um, it looks like this is quite a um, general form, uh, and remember in this particular test we are sort of either doing an F test for uh, under the null hypothesis that sort of delta 1 is equal to delta 2 is equal to sort of in general delta P which is equal to 0, and we could do sort of an F test or we could do an LM test. The idea is that our heteroscedasticity in this context only depends on linear combinations of our variables. And it turns out that the OLS estimators aren't blue or aren't best, uh, aren't the best linear unbiased estimators possible, even under more general forms of heteroscedasticity. And a, a good sort of evidence of a more sort of general form of heteroscedasticity might be if we have sort of our original thing, so delta naught plus delta one x one plus, you know, all the way up to delta p xp. And then if I had, let's say, gamma 1 times x1 squared, plus all the way up to sort of gamma p times xp squared, right? And if I have significance of any of these gamma terms now, then it turns out that that is also evidence of heteroscedasticity. It just doesn't look quite the same as heteroscedasticity we had before. Here, what we'd have is we'd have, if I was to sort of plot my residuals, let's say u squared against x1, if I held all my other variables constant, then perhaps I'd have something which looked like this in terms of my um, residuals. Yeah, and even though I might sort of get a sort of correlation between x1 and u squared being zero, then that would be quite a sort of foolish thing to conclude just because there was zero correlation, because if I sort of fit a line to this, it might be quite flat then it's still evidence that I've got some sort of relationship between the two of these variables, right? It's just that it's not a linear relationship. So if I have this sort of um, relationship between my residual squared and one of my variables or a combination of my variables, then it's probably evidence that there's some sort of quadratic or even more um, higher polynomial term relationship between x1 and u squared. And again, that's some sort of information which I should be including in my system. And if I don't include it in my system, then essentially I could form another linear unbiased estimator, which was more efficient. Or in sort of normal speak, it got closer to the true population parameter more of the time. So that's why the sort of reason, the rationale for including these sort of squared terms here, there's no reason I can't sort of include cubic terms though, or terms to the power of four. But the trouble is, if I start doing that, then I'm sort of increasing the chance that I might have just got um, some sort of significance by, um, by sampling error or by chance. So normally we don't include much past x cubed or even x squared, really. But often what we do include is we include our sort of product terms. So it turns out that if I've got heteroscedasticity or some sort of variance of my error, which depends on the product of x1 and x2, or the product of sort of x1 and xp, or sort of xk and xp, right? So sort of as general as I can, then it turns out that that is also um, heteroscedasticity in the sense of my least squared estimators are not blue in those conditions either. So we sort of include these cross terms as well. 
But the trouble with including all of these terms, the square terms and perhaps the cubic terms and the sort of cross terms, is that I'm eating up degrees of freedom, right? I, I'm placing more sort of constraint when I estimate this relationship on my regression coefficient. So if, if I'm eating up more degrees of freedom, then that actually means that my statistical tests aren't as powerful as they would be before, right? So we'd like a way to sort of estimate this relationship here, but using up fewer degrees of freedom. Well, White came up with a very nice way of doing this, which was instead of regressing our um, residual squared on just my sort of x variables and my squares and my x variables, then what he said we should do is we should take our y or estimated y, which our, our model sort of gives us from our first regression. So remember what estimated y is, it's the sort of what value of y which our sort of line predicts, right? So assuming that our sort of error is zero, then on average, our model predicts that y should be y hat. So the idea is that if we regress our square residuals on a sort of constant, and let's say y hat, and let's say y hat squared, then implicitly, when I'm regressing it on y hat, I'm actually regressing it on all of these x terms. And when I square y hat, then I'm going to get, not only am I going to get these sort of x1 squared, xp squared, I'm also going to get these product terms, that's all of these product terms which are going to come out as well, right? So the idea is that I have essentially done everything in this above regression, or this, this sort of auxiliary regression here with all these cross terms and nonlinear terms, but with far fewer independent variables. And that's beneficial because we've got more degrees of freedom to play with. And our statistical tests will tend to be more reliable under this second estimation technique. So the idea here is that we run this second auxiliary regression, and then we test for our sort of null hypothesis here, is that delta 1 is equal to delta 2, which is equal to 0. So that's assuming that we have homoscedastic errors, because if these are both equal to 0, then our, headers, our sort of variance of our error is just equal to a constant, so we've got homoscedastic errors. So the idea is that we either use an F-test or an LM-test to test for joint significance of delta 1 and delta 2. And if we reject the null hypothesis, then we conclude that there is some sort of heteroscedasticity.